Audible presents Silver Hammer by Rosha Walker, read by Sean Adler. Preface The iconic band The Beatles certainly doesn't require an introduction. The first real song I learned to play on the guitar was Blackbird, and as I continued to grow older, my fascination with the band grew as well. When the film Yesterday came out, I especially gained an interest in the band's evolution. When Abbey Road 50th Anniversary Edition came out on vinyl, I picked up a copy and experienced the music the way it was originally heard. My favorite track, as you may know by now, Maxwell Silver Hammer, became a symbol of avant-garde dramatic irony. The song tells the story of a few killings by a guy named Maxwell. He is a medicine major in college and kills a fellow student and teacher. When on trial for those killings, he kills the judge. As a disclaimer, I don't want the reader to expect this story to be an accurate retelling of the original. I simply wish to tell you of the inspiration behind it. In my freshman year of high school, I had the thought of writing this story. I eventually gave up after a few chapters. Looking back at the writing now makes me cringe. I hope in five years or so, when I look back at this, I will also cringe, just not as badly. That version of the story I was writing was a word-for-word -word attempt at recreating the song. I realize now, after a lot of time has passed, that I don't need to write Paul McCartney's specific story. I want to write Rosha Walker's story, the way I believe it'll impact the reader the best. Rosha N. Walker 1. Dahlia Harrison hears her alarm on a Friday morning. She turns her alarm off and with one eye shut opens her phone. After a few swipes on Facebook, she's awake. Shuffling to her bathroom, she takes a hot shower. On her way out the door, she doesn't check to see if her father's awake. He's in his late 70s and though she has memories of the divorce and what it did to her mother, she doesn't have the money to put him in a home nor the decency to leave him in the streets. In his state now, she hates looking at him. She used to fear him. Now she's only afraid of being in his place. She arrives at work early as always. Fortunately, none of the teenagers were attracted to her. Every few years, there's a smart kid who feels special because of their intellect. Naturally, they try to gravitate towards her. If only they knew she was in their place once too. Maybe then they'd lose their ego. Joan a student in her afternoon class, comes in uninvited. What can I do for you, Mrs. Starkey? I don't really know how to do your next homework assignment. I mean, you said not to use your examples, but those are the only things I can think of that change from solid to liquid. That's why I used them, Delia thought. Remember, it's also liquid to solid. You can pick either. I still don't know any. I can't give you the answer, Joan, but I can suggest you to a few sites. Would you like me to email them to you? Sure. Okay, I'll do that. I wonder how long it took for her to put on that makeup this morning, Dahlia thought. She seemed to pity Joan, though she hadn't made any bad decisions yet, to her knowledge. She knew they'd come soon enough. She doesn't try to get involved with the kids, Something inside of her says she's past the point of connection with them. It's a transaction, like most things in the world, she thought. I get money for teaching, you get the diploma. Soon the bell rings and her first class of the day begins. I hope your Thursday afternoon was good, she lied. 2. Jonah rose from her seat on the bus, where a boy avoided her gaze. She rejected him several stops earlier. She assumed he was still pissy about it. She walked a few blocks to the complex she and her father lived. She didn't make her presence known in the apartment. She went to her room and took the books out of her bag. As she was doing this, she heard an odd sound from her father's room. She stops in her tracks, just listening. Laughter? Or is he crying, she thought. She goes to his door and opens it slowly. She sees her father and one of his employees in the bed her mother used to share with him. A blanket was above their waist, but they were both shirtless. 
She's seen her father shirtless thousands of times, but it never made her grimace before. She walked to her room unaware of the tears streaming down her face. She grabbed her bag and opened the front door. Laughter, she thought as the door shut. 3. Rose practically jumped out of her seat when the bell rang in Miss Harrison's class. She went straight for the lunch line since it piles naturally. She picks up a piece of cardboard pizza and a chalky milk. She went straight to her group of friends. In between two classes in a hallway often left vacant, likely because only those that take either class knew its existence in the first place, Valerie, Joan, and Paul were talking she arrived. I'm thinking about just sleeping over at a friend's house and not telling her. See if that gets her to stop nagging me all the time, Paul said as Rose walked in. She found a place to sit and ate quickly, listening into the conversation. What about your hamster? Valerie asked. I could leave him starving for a month and he'd be fine. Besides, he still has a good amount of food and water. He'll be fine for a few days if I do it. A boy, Max, walks through the hallway. Hey, where are you going? Rose blurted out as he walked past her. Somewhere, he responded. Rose looked at her smiling friends. Go ask him this time, Valerie demanded. Rose smiled, got up, and ran to him. There was something about Maxwell. Rose liked his style and the way he seemed to know where he was going. He had a very attractive face in her opinion, and she often acknowledged how little he seemed to care for other women. She wanted him. Hey Max, what are you doing after school? I'll probably go dumpster diving. She waited to be invited, told she looked nice today, for him to change plans for her. He stared back at her for a few moments. Only a few moments. See ya! Max walked past her. Rose stood there for a moment, only a moment, and joined her friends back in the hallway. Valerie gave her a hug. 4. With dry eyes, Joan walked through the vacant street. She turns directions, walking behind a set of local stores. It was peaceful, quiet. She would always see the front of these stores. Most people did, but something felt so intimate about being in the back. Nobody ever goes behind the store, or so she thought. As she continued to walk, she passed a dumpster that made a mild thumping sound. Initially, she assumed an animal was in there, until she heard a familiar voice. She couldn't place who it was, but she didn't move as she assumed the culprit would show. A few minutes later, Maxwell popped his head out. He stared at Joan. This moment lasted no longer than a minute. It wasn't awkward. To Joan, it felt sort of primal, like an animal sizing another up. Valerie, Max said after the sizing was up. Joan. I was close, he said with a grin. What are you doing? Dumpster diving. What about you? Did you find anything? Joan replied. Eh, the only thing of value I found so far was, uh... His head went under the dumpster once more. This! Joan saw a hammer, shiny like new, with a wooden handle. It's nice, Joan said after a time. It doesn't have value to me yet, you know. I guess. Max tossed the hammer to the floor and got out. Joan stood, unmoving, as he came closer to her. Face to face, Joan acknowledged his eyes. He seemed to be looking past her. He was an attractive man. His upper body was defined well. He wore a sleeveless shirt, though Joan kept eye contact. She wondered, what was he thinking? What brings you here? Max asked. I just needed to go somewhere, you know. She looked away, though Max didn't falter. Are you hiding something? Joan stared into his eyes again. He turned and went back to the dumpster. Joan stood for a moment and followed, went to a wall. She sat across from the bin Max was in. She listened to the sounds made by Maxwell, and yet in her mind, all she heard was silence. 5. Dahlia stares at the time on her computer just as the teenager stared at the clock. 
They all hear the bell. Max, will you please stay a moment? Okay. She gets up from her chair and walks to him. She stops one desk away. Can you tell me why you were late to class? In truth, she could care less. In the grand scheme of her life and his life, why he was late to class on this day didn't matter. But she was required to ask as a sort of admit you're wrong thing. Sometimes I lose track of time. Let's try to be on time more, okay? Sure. From her years of teaching, she knew some things were inevitable. Students hating her, an abundance of disrespect. When it came to kids like Maxwell, she kept the interactions minimal. An adolescent boy, a silent observer. For the off chance he was to harm the school, she didn't want to be a target. Dahlia felt something from Max. If he was a different person, she might ask him if he was okay. Sometimes it's better to avoid personal details, she thought while excusing him to lunch. 6. Richard Harrison awoke at 4 a.m. This was usually out of his control. At his age, he seemed to need less sleep. He was tired all the time. He saw the sun rising through the white curtains as he waited for his daughter to get ready. He heard her shower start, so he closed his eyes and waited. He knew she didn't like to socialize in the morning. When the front door was shut by his daughter, he grabbed the remote and began flipping channels. This he did until a favorable program spawned. He would follow this ritual any time a less favorable show would take place. This went on for hours until the nurse Dahlia hired arrived. She was paid for an hour. She would come late and leave early. She fixes him something and puffs up his pillow, changes his bladder bag, doesn't make conversation, isn't paid to have a friendship. This day she arrives around 3.15 and leaves around 3.40. He watches his shows like he always does. He no longer fears death, more awaiting it. This methodical limbo his life has become gave no meaning. Richard sees something in his peripheral, the shape of someone. He puts his glasses on and sees a boy. He doesn't have fear. All that's left is hate. How'd you get in here, boy? He walks towards Richard, grabs a pillow that fell. He stares at the boy quizzically. The boy walks to the old man and robotically puts the pillow over his face. Richard resisted. He wanted to live. Did he? He tries to push him off, but didn't seem to use all of his strength. He stopped breathing. 7. Valerie swiped on Instagram, sending vids to friends or tagging them in the comments. Rose calls through Instagram. Val sighs briefly and answers. Hello, Valerie said. I just woke up mid-rems. I legit had the dumbest dream. Spill. Fucking Max was there. And he was just, like, really nice. And we were, like, dating. And he hung out with us. And it was just, like, really annoying. Valerie hated Max. Not as a person, but as a conversation starter. Sounds like you're more annoyed it isn't real. Well, yeah, that's why it's annoying. She heard Rose's breath through the phone. Why don't you ask him out to a movie or something? Well, earlier I was trying to go with him somewhere, but he had plans. Jumping in trash doesn't count as plans. Yeah, well, he values trash more than me, so thanks. Just ask him to a picture and see what he says. The worst he can say is no. And you'll feel better knowing you tried. Valerie waited for a response, but heard nothing but involuntary breathing. Thanks, Val. I'm gonna try and sleep again, so see you tomorrow, okay? KK, talk to you later. Click. Valerie swipes on Instagram with a sense of irritation. Something had left her feeling annoyed. 8. It was well beyond Dahlia's workday. Though she tried to keep busy in her classroom, assignments had been graded and curriculum was up to date. She still didn't want to go home. The man who broke her mother's heart was waiting. She'd be forced to spend time with him over the weekend. 
Though she stalled for time, it never really made a difference. Just like every Friday, despite her efforts, she unlocked the front door to her home. Upon entering, she gave a forceful greeting. Dad, I'm home. She walked to his room and was introduced to a lifeless vessel. She walked up to him. She put her hand on his wrist, awaiting the natural, repetitive heartbeat. She moved her hand to his neck and awaited as she did prior. Nothing. She gave a heavy breath that may have been relief. She felt her body begin to shake impulsively. She takes her phone out and goes to the phone app. She dials the number 9. Darkness envelops her. She hears the familiar voice of her student as she lets go. 9. Joan felt a sense of boredom. She thought Max would be more interesting. She at least thought he might have some interest in her. They've moved three times so far from dumpster to dumpster. After only 40 minutes, she gets up to leave. Max continues to rummage. She begins to walk away, taking her time. She acknowledged Rose's attraction for Max as she found herself wanting his attention. When she arrived home, her father was watching television shirtless. Joan shuddered. Where were you? he asked. Out, she responds, avoiding his gaze. You could have told me, he says as she walks past him to her room and shuts the door. She didn't come out for the rest of the day. When she awoke the next morning, she acknowledged the smell of sausage and eggs. She went to the kitchen to see her father cooking and texting. She sits at the table. Good morning. How did you sleep? I slept okay. How about you? I slept fine, he says, placing a plate of food down in front of her. Where did you go yesterday? Joan looked down at the plate. Be honest with me, please. I was hanging out with a friend. What did you guys do? Joan itched her eye. Joan? Oh, uh... We, or he, was dumpster diving and I watched. <laughs> dumpster diving? Really? Did he find anything good? There was a brand new hammer, she chuckled to herself. Huh, wonder why someone would throw that away? He smiled, placing the eggs on her plate. A moment later, he placed sausage on her plate as well. She began eating as her father looked at her softly. With a few bites left on her plate... Joan heard the familiar notification sound from her father's phone. He takes it out, eagerly reading the message. Joan stops eating, gets up, and scrapes her plate in the trash. When this was done, she goes back to her room and changes. She grabs her backpack and comes out of the room. She sees her father in the same position on his phone, typing away. He briefly looks up and notices her outfit. Where are you going now? I have to go to the store for a science thing. What science thing? I have to present a solid to liquid or liquid to solid. I also have to make like a poster. It's due Tuesday, so yeah. What are you choosing? Jello. Want me to give you a ride? It's fine, she asks as she begins to leave. Well, how long do you think you'll be gone? Huh? Oh, uh, 20 or 30 minutes. Bye, Dad. Bye, sweetheart. She walks out of the house. 10. Rose laid on her bed in a flower pattern pajama set and took the plunge, opening Instagram and messaging Maxwell. His profile picture was a selfie of him sporting a light brown cap. He had no photos and 68 followers. She started the conversation. Hey. A few minutes later, got a response. Hey, can we call? Okay. Rose calls Maxwell and awaited his answer. Hello? Hey, Max, I was wondering if you'd like to go to the movies with me tomorrow. What movie? Uh, I don't know. I hadn't chosen one yet. Nah, I'm good. Maybe some other time, okay? Click. She sits there, awaiting a call back. A few minutes later, she accepts the reality. She calls her friend Valerie, but she doesn't answer. She calls her friend Joan, but she doesn't answer. 11. 
Joan was walking out from the store and gets a call. She ignores her dumb friend. She had the urge to walk behind the store. He's probably in another trash can, she thought. She checks the place from before, and lo and behold, he's there. Max looks up, somehow sensing her. Hi, he begins. What's that? It's for that one project in Mrs. Harrison's class. I wouldn't worry about it. Why not? Just because. Joan accepts this response and sits on the wall like yesterday. After a time of social silence, Joan speaks up. How's your relationship with your father? What? Max says, getting up from the dumpster. How's your relationship with your father? I hardly know him. We never hug. I come home for dinner. And that's about it. Why? Never mind. Maxwell gets out of the trash and sits next to her, his eyes still unmoving. Want to talk about it? Not really. Max gets closer to her and sits there enjoying the breeze. Joan puts her hand on his leg. He doesn't move it. She puts a hand on his crotch. No arousal. After a moment or two, Max gets up. Remember this? Max says, getting up and reaching for the side of the dumpster. He brings the hammer out. She smiles, a sort of smile a mother gives when her child jumps off the swing. He hits the trash can, making a loud clang sound. There was a dent left. Joan scoots back, still on the ground. Maxwell puts the hammer to her head. At first, her breath was heavy. She closes her eyes. No tears, no fear. A beautiful calmness was seen on Joan's face when Maxwell smashed her face in. He was aroused. 12. Police Constable Number 31, Dan Waller, drives his vehicle behind markets, warehouses, departments, and pharmacies in search of a lead suspect in a homicide done earlier that day. The suspect left the murder weapon at the scene and didn't remove the prints. The assumed suspect is one Maxwell Edison, age 18. They found his prints from a background check done earlier in the year. PC-31 was one among dozens who was searching for the elusive killer. That's why, when he found Maxwell behind a hardware store, he physically began to shake. He looked down and grabbed his walkie. He requests backup. When he looked up, he found Maxwell staring at him through the window. He got out of his car. In a very serious tone, he said, Are you Maxwell Edison? Yes. You are under arrest, he began as he brought his handcuffs out. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney during interrogation. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to you. Maxwell turns around, putting his hands behind his back. After a quick but thorough search, Dan opens the back seat and Max enters. Once both were in the car, he walkies his arrest and their location. When they arrive at the station, two police officers grab Maxwell and walk him inside. Once inside, PC-31 was not expected to write an arrest report, but instead speak privately with an investigator on his perspective. After they went through his experience, thoroughly reviewing everything as it occurred, the investigator asked, Be honest, Waller. What vibe did you get from him? No one will read of this next part unless you permit. I don't permit, but the way he acted was so cold. He felt sort of dirty. I understand. Do you believe you are emotionally available to testify against him if needed? Well, if absolutely needed, I believe so. 13. Pete Starkey watches his daughter Joan leave the house. He debates inviting his new FWB over as he did yesterday. I shouldn't risk Joan finding out. He gets another buzz on his phone. Do you think she knows? He responds. IDK. Pete sees the three dots. I don't have to come over. He looks around. Come over. He sets his phone down. Thirteen minutes later, a younger man of twenty opens the door. He's wearing a violet button-up and a wife beater below. He has khakis on and a belt buckle with the letters MK. 
When the young man approaches, they embrace. Before we go further, how much time do we have? My daughter will be out all day. No way she'll catch us, Pete said without maintaining eye contact. A few hours later, they were both laying in his bed. When the younger man placed his head on Pete's chest, he felt his heart beat quickly. Are you okay? Huh? Oh, sorry. Just kind of worried about my daughter. Why? Pete inhales and exhales a heavy sigh. I lied earlier about her being gone all day. She was supposed to be home a while ago. What? Why? Why did you lie about that? He got up from Pete's chest. Pete grabbed the sheet covers and pulled them close to him. Peter, why did you lie about that? He raised his voice. Pete sighed heavy once more. I just thought... Fuck. It's hard to say out loud. I just... I thought it would be easier for her to catch us than for me to tell her. Wow. Wow. That's fucked up, dude. That's your daughter. She's only a few years younger than me, you know. He gets out of bed, putting his costume back on. Pete doesn't stop him. The young man leaves. Pete lays, listening to the motor of his lover's vehicle rumble. Soon the sound fades. A minute later, he gets up, put his clothes back on, and grabs his keys. 14. Rose's father, Jude, clicked his remote. Next channel, next channel, next channel. Arriving at an unfamiliar news outlet showing the local courthouse, this young man who was on trial for multiple counts of murder was shot to death in the Lytton County courtroom Sunday. That's after officials say he attacked Superior Court Judge Kerrigan Kite during a break in the proceedings. Police say 18-year-old Maxwell Edison left the witness stand, approached her from behind, and began attacking her with a blunt instrument. The judge left the courtroom on a stretcher. She was alert, telling reporters she was okay. Police Constable 31 Dan Waller is the officer who fatally shot Edison. Officials say he's been placed in administration leave while the shooting is investigated. The courthouse immediately went to lockdown after the incident. Officials say they're not sure how Edison obtained the weapon. The name faded into screen. Lucas Finn Jr. in Justice Press. 15. Pete Starkey started his search for his daughter, where she claimed to be several hours prior. Going to the market that was in walking distance to their house, he parked his car and went inside. Briefly acknowledging the air conditioning, he quickly went through each aisle to no avail. He went next door, a salon, just to check. When he was walking back to his car, he realized she was likely being promiscuous herself. A weight of relief went off his shoulders. Dumpster diving, how could I not read between the lines? A slight sense in his gut believed they may actually be near the dumpster. To itch that feeling, he did a quick drive behind the store. On first glance, it looked like a dumpster. He waited, perhaps expecting to hear her daughter moaning in the dumpster, to catch her in the act and take any attention off him. On third glance, he noticed blood on the sidewalk near the trash can. He quickly got out of the car, wide-eyed. He speed-walked towards the dried blood and then peered down at the dumpster. He screamed. Epilogue Rose was crying over the loss of her friend. Or was she crying over the failure to interest a man? She read post after post. Hashtag Maxwell Silverhammer. Hashtag Hammer Killer. Hashtag Maxwell Stand. Hashtag Max Talk. With no thoughts in her mind, she created a Reddit page titled r slash justice for Maxwell Edison. So began the first fan page. Soon after, the page received its first follow and upvote. Valerie commented, I can't believe we knew him. You two almost dated. It's crazy how he died. Rose liked the comment. This has been Audible's reading of Silver Hammer by Rosha Walker, read by Sean Adler. Thank you for listening.